are we there? Where am I? Oh, I have to stop my screen share. There we go. <laughs> Hi, everybody, and welcome to In-House Con. This is Derek Mackey from Cool Waters Productions. I appreciate you guys all joining us today. Oh, I look a little uh, out white, out white washed out with my white coat. Oh, who cares? Um, anyway, thanks for joining us today, folks. I'm glad you're all here. Let's see what we have to think today and what we have to prep for today. So who are we? I'm Derek Mackey with Cool Waters Productions. We are an appearance management company that reps over 140 actors, amazing, talented people that I love and adore. And we travel the world going to fan conventions all throughout the year, bringing people face to face with you guys, the fans watching us today. Because of COVID-19, our industry has basically been shut down by every government on the planet. So we are not allowed to come to your country or your state or your city to visit with you. So we decided to start this little online TV series and online convention to bring our wonderful talent to your living room, and we appreciate you joining us today. We hope that COVID-19 will not last forever, and that way we can actually come out and meet you all face-to-face, -face, shake hands, give hugs, sign autographs in person, so on and so forth, because it is what we really appreciate and enjoy. You guys are amazing as fans, and I know every client that I have would like to be able to actually interact with you all. But uh, for now, this will have to do, so thanks for joining. I need to do some special shout outs today. People who helped get the word out about our event. I want to thank Trek Movie. I want to thank Trek Central. I want to thank Pop Culture Hero Coalition. I want to thank Trek Geeks, NerdReport.com, The Omega Particle Podcast, Jay Stubby, and of course, all of our social media fans who retweeted and tweeted about our event this week. Thank you so very much. Now, how does this work today? Uh, we are going to do, we're going to introduce our guests in a, in a few minutes. I have some predetermined questions for them all to get the ball rolling and we will open up the floor or the virtual floor to all of the viewers out there to ask questions of each of our guests, which they will answer live on air when you ask it. Now, how do you ask a question? It's very simple. On Zoom, there are two sections. Be clear, the section marked chat is only for the fans to interact in. Uh, myself, my tech guy, and the guests do not go into the chat room. That is for fans only, okay? If you guys wanna ask a question of one of our talent, you have to go to the Q and A room. There is a button on Zoom, lower right-hand corner. It says Q and A. That is where you submit your question. And when we get to that part, I will read the question aloud and the celebrity will answer it, okay? Keep the questions neat and clean. We're just here to have fun. Also, for those of you watching on a laptop or a desktop computer, whether it's a, a Apple or an IBM, whatever you have, we recommend watching the show in gallery view. Gallery view allows you to see all of the guests and myself on screen all together. If you choose to view it on um, the non-gallery view, I don't know what it is because I don't use it, but anyway, if you don't watch it in gallery, then Zoom is going to self-edit as we go talking live with each of our clients. And what Zoom tends to do is it focuses on anyone making noise. So if one of our clients are giving an answer and you're really focused on what they're saying, but another person laughs or tries to interject, Zoom may cross over to that person and you'll miss other reactions. It's totally up to you how you want to view us. Those of you watching on a smartphone, uh, sorry, the Zoom platform does not allow you to do gallery view, and you're kind of stuck with watching whatever Zoom gives you. But don't worry, I've asked all of our guests to keep talk uh, crosstalk to a minimum to allow for you guys to focus on who's talking, but please bear with us. We're here to have fun today. This is, this is all supposed to be carefree and, and, and light. So if someone's over, cross over talking, just let it go, okay? We're here to have some fun. So again, thanks for joining us. I think I've plugged every, I, I think I've done everything. Special shout outs. Yes, I have. So without further ado, we're gonna get to our guests. Now, for those of you who have joined us in the past, usually we have video snippets or trailers or clips from a series that our, our guests have been in. But today we're going to uh, forego that and I'm <laughs> gonna tell you why. Little insider secret. A couple, a uh, few weeks back, we did a, another Star Trek event uh, like this, and we actually showed the trailer 
for Star Trek Discovery season three. Now it's all over the internet. It's all over TV. It's, I mean, the, the trailer is literally everywhere. So we put it into the event because we had some Star Trek Discovery guests and we wanted to promote the show. Well, CBS didn't like that too much and they actually had us pull that off of YouTube. We always put our shows on YouTube about two weeks after we air live. They made us pull it. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna edit out the trailer and then we're gonna put back up the interview so you all can see it. So for this week, I have decided we're going to forego any of that licensing stuff and we're just going to introduce the guests. You guys all know them and love them anyway. And if there's something that they talk about today that you need to go see, then we invite you to either watch it on Netflix, Hulu, Amazon, buy the DVD, rent the DVD, watch it in reruns, what have you, or watch anything new that they're doing now. So showing you something here during the panel doesn't really matter. So without further ado, let's bring on our first guest, and I'd like to introduce from Star Trek Discovery, Mr. Ronnie Rowe Jr. And my tech guy, Tyler, will make him active in one second here. Maybe. There we go. There he is. Hello, Ronnie. How are you, sir? I'm amazing. How are you? I am wonderful. I thank you so much for joining us today. Where are you calling in from today? I'm in Toronto right now. Good, good old Toronto. Is it hot and humid there like it is here in LA or you guys have nice weather? Heck no, it's, it's actually, it's pretty cold right now. So <laughs> that's why I'm in a sweater. Yeah, it, oh, wow. it's, a, it's a little chilly right now. Okay, well, there you go. Well, Ronnie, we appreciate you taking time out of your day. Uh, hang tight, we're gonna make your video disappear while we bring on our other guests, okay? All right, so our next guest, also a Star Trek Discovery uh, alumni or actor, we're gonna bring in uh, Damon Runyon. So let's welcome Damon. And it takes just a second, guys, to activate the video. Here he comes. Hello, hello, Damon. How are you, sir? I'm very well. How are you? I am wonderful. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. And where might you be calling in from? I am calling from my beautiful basement in uh, Toronto. Ah, so you're, you're near Ronnie, where it's nice and cold. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's definitely the transition has begun. It's, it's fall. It's football time. Football time. All right. Who do you who do you root for in, up there in Canada? Uh, sadly, the New York Football Giants, and uh, it's hard to root these days. Okay, yeah. I don't know much about sports, so we'll leave it at that. But there you thank, go. Thank you for joining us today. <laughs> We're going to make your video disappear while we bring on our next guest. Okay. All right. Our next guest is uh, from the Star Trek Motion Pictures that J.J. Abrams directed. We're going to bring on Jason Matthew Smith. And we had lost him for a second, but I know he's there because I saw the video pop back on. There he is. Hello, Jason. Hey, how are you doing? Welcome to the show, sir. Where are you calling in from today? Thank you. Uh, Studio City, California. Excellent. Los Angeles, right in my backyard. So you and I are sweating it out today. I think it's going to reach 103 today. That's ridiculous. At least the air quality is a little bit better. Those fires up north have uh, been, been killing us down here. Yeah, that was horrible. I had to walk every morning and there were, I had to not walk for two weeks because the smoke was so thick. The first day I did it, I actually was hacking like I had smoked 10 packs of cigarettes. Uh, my, my car, you know, I, if you park it out on the street ever, it's just covered in a layer of ash, you know, and you're breathing that stuff in all the time. It's, it's, it's definitely a, a crisis out here with the air quality and uh, you know, uh, of course, the wildfire destruction. I heard today there was like four million acres. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's so sad. It's mind boggling. Well, we appreciate that you and your family are safe and that you were able to join us today. So thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, sir. Hang tight. Your video is going to disappear while we bring in our last guest. She is from the Star Trek The Next Generation series. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jennifer Barlow. Diddy, diddy. We need like fanfare. Without these videos, it doesn't work. I think next week I'm going to have fanfare in some way. Hello, Jennifer. Hi. Hi, Hi Jennifer. <laughs> Jennifer, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you so much for having me be a part of this. Oh, thank you for joining us. And where might you be calling in from today? I am in Northern California, so I am surrounded by unhealthy air, but um, the weather is only about 80 today but I'm at my mother's house and we're having a lot of fun. 
Oh, good, good, good. And you're, and are you near any of the fires? Yes. I mean, there's, it, it, uh, I guess the nearest one is probably about 40 minutes away, but the smoke just moves with the wind and there's just traveling orange clouds all over the skies. Oh, good. So it's great. pretty daunting. Well, thank you for taking time out of your day today to join us. I greatly appreciate it. We are going to bring in all of our guests now so that all four of them are live on the air with me. Again, if you guys are in gallery view, you'll be able to see all five of us together. And <clears throat> I'm going to start off the questions today. We basically, guys, especially when it's a themed event, uh, we have this basically standard question that has basically become an in-house con tradition, and I'm not going to change it today. Specifically today, we are talking about the Star Trek universe. And what I'd like to know from each of our guests is, how did you get your role specifically in the Star Trek universe? And why don't we do ladies first? Jennifer, how did you get your role in the Star Trek universe? Well, um, just basically a call from my agent saying that they were looking for someone for Star Trek a, a female to pilot the Enterprise when Wesley was not on the show, sort of a backup. And they wanted somebody, um, how do I say this? It's going to make me blush. They wanted someone who was curvy and could fill out the suits, but still come off as intelligent. So they told me they were looking for a Lonnie Anderson type, which I don't know if you know who she was, but she was on a series for a while on a sitcom. So I, I had not, I, I watched a lot of the old Star Treks, but I wasn't up to date on the next generation. So I did sort of a crash course, but I used to make fun of uh, them and be, don't be a chicken bones. And it's a jungle gym. And so I literally tried to adapt this kind of very professional. It was a very long winded bit of dialogue they gave me. It was on and on and on. So you literally had to take pauses, a lot of commas, to get this very technical dialogue, which I was given in the audition. Um, and that was pretty much it. I got a call back. I got the part. I was jumping up and down, very excited. And that's how I was the first female to pilot the Enterprise, except for his wife, who I think piloted in the series. I mean, in the um, pilot. Gene Roddenberry's wife, I believe she piloted the Enterprise in the very first pilot, I think. That may be true. My, my tech guy, Tyler, is a Trek expert, and he can chime in at any time uh, to verify that when he, if he verifies it or if he knows it. So Tyler, feel free to interrupt when you're ready. But continuing on, let's go to Damon next. Damon, how did you land your role in the Star Trek universe? Uh, well, uh, I heard it was coming to town and uh, I, I alerted my agent to the fact that I'd want to be a part of it. And sure enough, like a, um, uh, I, I was working on something and a self tape came in and it was kind of ambiguous. It was, um, it was about, uh, I believe it takes, I'm not even sure if it worked its way into the story, but it was a, a human uh, that was, well, it was a Klingon that was disguised as a human. Uh, interrogating him and uh, sort of like like a four page scene that I didn't really know like if it was gonna actually happen or if it was just like a general um, audition piece for the show because it was so new and um, then about a month later I heard that uh, I didn't I, I wasn't gonna be that character but I was gonna be this character Ujili. Oh, we might have uh, Damon. Like, because like got like announced as a part of the cast. What's that? We we uh, lost you connection. for a second. We lost okay. you for a second. Yes, but... I'm very unstable down here. Okay. Um, yeah. So uh, long story short, uh, you know, I got announced as a part of the cast, and then I realized that I was a Klingon. I didn't even really know that how I was coming to be this. And even on like the uh, the first day on set, I'm like like what's kind of involved and I walk on set and uh you know it's like these massive sound stages and uh they're like uh, like nobody even knows who I am you know and like the security doesn't know who you are and I'm like is this just a massive mistake and uh I get there and they're like are you Damon I'm like yeah and they're like they're waiting for you We're, I'm like what are you talking about it's like seven o'clock in the morning 
but they were shooting, we were just doing off camera lines. So everyone was in full makeup. I had no idea like who I was talking to. It was, it was hilarious, but yeah, that's how I came to be. That's cool. Very cool. Thank you, sir. Jason, how about you? How'd you land your role in the motion pictures that JJ Abrams directed? Well, um, gosh, that was a long time ago. Um, I think uh, yeah, it was around 2007 is when I first um, got a call from my agent for an audition. They wouldn't tell me what it was for. Um, they just said it was something, um, you know, high profile, top secret. And uh, so I, I had no clue what I was auditioning for. They, they sent something that uh, said farm boy number one or something like that. It was like none of the names were like Kirk or Spock or none, none of that stuff. So I, I you know, I go in there and, um, and audition and I tried to, you know, find out from the casting director. I was like, what is this for? And they're like, uh, it's, we can't say, but it's Star Trek. <laughs> I was like, oh, really? It was like, they're doing a, a movie. And I was like, yeah. I was like, well, who am I auditioning for? And they said, you're auditioning for Farm Boy number one. That's as much as we know. So I was like, okay. And um, I did my reading on camera. It wasn't for, uh, it, normally you have like a, you know, producer session where you have other people in the room with you, director, producer, writer, somebody like that, even other actors, but this was just purely on camera. And um, it was one time thing, went in there and then I got a call about, I don't know, maybe a, a week or two later that said that I had booked this role in Star Trek and fell to my knees in the middle of Hollywood and thanked you know, the gods for, for making it happen. Wow, very cool. Wow. That, is, that is the dream job for a lot of actors and you got it. Wow. That is, I'm envious. I was very fortunate, very blessed. Thank you for sharing your story. Ronnie, how did you land your role in the Star Trek universe? Uh, it's my turn. Um, yeah, the conventional audition, but it's interesting because I started off as a shuttle pilot. So um, when I got hired with Star Trek, I, I was hired as uh, the shuttle pilot. And I remember um, Akiva was, um, he was one of the EPs at the time. He was um, directing the episode and he was like, you know what, I, I really like you. He's like, um, you're gonna come back. I was like, oh, cool, great, great. And, and now I'm Bryce, uh, communications officer. So it, yeah, that's, that's how I, I, I joined the, the family. So you, you greased the right wheels by having someone be so impressed with you that they said you're coming back. Another, another what everyone dreams for. So good for you, man. You, you made it sound a lot better than I did. So I'll, I'll take your, your response over mine. <laughs> Very cool. All right, guys. So now with all of that, so I've got questions for all of you, but, and, I, and you've all made my mind think with stuff that you said, but okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to stick with another general Star Trek questions so I can compose how I want to start individual questions. So, and this has become a staple with our Star Trek shows. And it's actually one that a lot of the actors have had a lot of fun with because it's something that is, uh, it's kind of like our phones. Never did we think the day would come that we would have computers in our hands. With that said, what Star Trek tech do you wish actually existed? And it doesn't have to be from the exact Trek show or movie that you were in, it can be from any of the Trek universe in whatsoever. What Trek tech do you wish really existed? Ronnie, you go for it, man. Uh, teleporter. I agree. I yeah. hate riding on airplanes. <laughs> just, just get me where I want to go like that and I'm, I'm a happy guy. I, I definitely, definitely want a teleporter. <laughs> All right. Jason, how about you? See, I'd probably say warp speed, definitely. You know, because there's so much of the universe out there that, that needs exploring and definitely uh, having a way to get there within, you know, your lifetime or within minutes or seconds would be super cool. And that, that might be, that might come first before the, tr the transportation, the uh, teleportation. So 
that would alleviate my airplane problem as well because we could go across the country in five seconds. So I, I would go with either yeah. of them. <laughs> okay. As long as we don't end up like an egg on the on the wall, you know. <laughs> There's got to be some kind of gravity system working or something. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, thank you. Damon, Trek Tech, which, what is your dream Trek Tech? I think I'm frozen again. To, uh, it definitely would be teleporter. Am I there now? We can hear you. We just don't see okay. you moving. But okay, okay cool. So teleportation. Excellent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Get me out of here. <laughs> get, get you out of your basement? Or <laughs> Yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Jennifer. Trek tech that you wish existed. The Vulcan mind meld. I would want oh. to be able to just <sighs> control freak, you know. Okay. <laughs> We have not had that answer before, and that delves a little bit into your personality. I like it. I like it. Okay. Good, good, good. All right. So uh, Damon just reset himself. Okay. So Ronnie, I'm going to jump to you now, and uh, I'm doing this in no particular order, guys, so I'm not favoring anybody. I love all of my clients equally. I, I just jump around my page. But Ronnie, I am going to start with you. Oh, so no, and no, don't worry. It's, it's all good. Uh, I, as much as I adore and I love all of my clients and a lot of our viewers know this now, and as much as I like to think that I know a lot about them, the best part of the show, of this show for me is I do research on everybody and I learn things about my clients that I didn't know before and or I, I verify right here on the show because maybe it's not true. So one of the things that I looked up about Ronnie it, and, and I love this because Cultural backgrounds are so important to me. I, I'm, you know, I'm, my family is French Canadian on both sides. And my mom, who's listening today, you know, she'll have to educate me more on some Canadian stuff. But my husband is Mexican. And I've, I've learned a lot about his Mexican heritage. And Dia de Muertes is now like my favorite holiday. I love it. So with all that said, Ronnie, you have backgrounds for, from Jamaica, Cuba, and Panama. And mm -hmm. what I'd like to know is, um, first of all, do you, have you ever been to any of those places? Do you still have family there? And of the, of the three, is there one where the, there's something about that culture that you thrive on and you celebrate it in your life, either annually or day to day? Um, I've been to Cuba and Jamaica. I haven't been to Panama. Um, and I would say the one I was most immersed in was my Jamaican background. And uh, what I celebrate every day is the food. <laughs> um, yeah, I absolutely uh, love Jamaican food. My, my mother's a, a great cook, so I, I try and go and see her as much as I can to, to delve into that. But um, other, other than that, it's, it, the, the culture is pretty, uh, it's pretty hilarious. Um, I, I think I got a lot of who I am from my, my, my parents and their culture. So the Jamaican culture is probably a, a huge, the biggest influence in in my life for sure okay and and is panama on your bucket list of places to go eventually when we're allowed to travel again most definitely all right excellent <laughs> thank you for sharing let's jump to jennifer now so jennifer but you've done something that you know a lot of people in the industry have done but you've seemed to have a lot of success on it because when you look at your your credits on imdb it's not like one credit here, one credit there. It's like lists of credits. So you kind of did this transition from being in front of the camera as an actress to doing a lot of behind the scenes work, including directing, writing, but a lot of editing, which is, you know, editing is a very, I, I went to school for film, so I know what is involved in editing and, and films would not be what they are and TV series would not be what they are today without a very good editor who can make the story flow. So, you know, what, how, why did you switch? Or maybe you didn't switch, maybe you're still doing both, but you know, what sparked your brain to go, look, I wanna do a little bit behind the cameras. I wanna do the editing and the writing and directing. And with that said, is there one that you prefer, prefer more? Wow, that's a, that's a lot of questions. And those are great questions. Um, I sort of have a lot of hyphens and I think it sort of it evolved. Um, when I was an actress, when I was just an actress, I was playing a lot of bimbos and um, that was fun. I loved playing bimbos. They were like, oh, you know, but I was not finding that I was getting roles that um, 
I, I wanted to play something meatier. So I started writing actually first after playing like three go-go dancers and a hooker and what have you, I started writing. And that sort of took off for me. And for a while, my agent wanted me to be sort of the comedian that also wrote her own parts. And then somehow when I was at William Morris back then, reality started, reality TV came out. And my agent paired me up with another client who was also an actress and a writer. And he knew that we, we were kind of shooting our own little movies. And he said, you girls know how to do this. Go, go shoot a TV show, a reality show idea, edit it together. And it just sold. Like we had a bidding war on our very first concept which was about um, guys that shoot breaking news in the middle of the night. They're called stringers, sort of like night crawlers. So we had a bidding war on that show and then we did two more and it just kind of like all of a sudden that was the direction my career was taking me. I've never given up acting. It's just, I didn't have time to do both. And this was sort of where I was falling. And then because we edited our own sizzle reel to sell the show, um, A&E wanted us to also edit the pilot. So it sort of just, I just sort of went with the flow. I'm kind of a hippie girl from the, you know, like I go with the flow. And I ended up in the editing bay and producing and still writing and directing as well. But I mostly make my living as an editor. And it's good to have that Vulcan mind melt because I can now do it with picture, right? I edit people, you can edit and make people feel an emotion or another emotion, but, and I also put the music on. So I do the music and the editing and, and it's fun. Um, I really, really like it, but yeah, never, never going to give up on acting because you just never know when some, you get the phone call saying, Hey, do you want to be in this? And I'm like, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. You never lose that bug, right? It's always there. It's always there. Let me switch to Damon. Now, Damon, <clears throat> you were the star of gangland undercover. And, and obviously that, you know, that's one thing that you, but you, you, you're the actual lead of that show. You're, you know, it's, it's all about you and your character. And you've also had the honor aside from just Star Trek of guest starring or co-starring in other, in other series as well. But specifically what I'd like to know is what are the big differences as an actor where you're the lead, you're carrying the show and you're a guest star and you know, I'm assuming there must be a little less pressure and how did you, how do you personally prepare, you know, for your role when you're a lead? Tell us a little bit about that. Well, it's funny you say that because I'm, I'm kind of wrestling with that right now. Um, I'm on the show called Home Before Dark on Apple TV and, and uh, you know, I'm, I'm a supporting character, but recurring and, and uh, often you come in and obviously the storyline is not uh, about you, but uh like, I mean, everyone's story is important. So the more that you bring to the role, the, the better the story is. Um, I found it a lot easier. Well, no, that's not true. But being a lead, um, I was able to not be uh, concerned about whether I was stealing focus as opposed to letting the actual story line flow or the plot flow. You know, a lot of People, especially when they're starting out, they get a role and they get intimidated by whatever it is or they get on set and they think it's all about them. And uh, that that works against the story, you know, where where you get on a show and you're supporting it, it it's it's I find it a little trickier to like to navigate those waters in terms of like what color what colors you're painting with. Whereas on when I was uh, when I when I when I was doing Gangland, which I'm trying to get back up and running, um, the whole I mean the day to day was more about informing the story with uh, nuances of little things, especially like being um, an undercover informant. You know that the whole world is alive all the time. So I just found it a lot more. It was more readily accessible as opposed to like I could I could have the director's ear, I could have the producer's ear. When you're supporting, uh, you know, you come and do your job and and uh, you know, I'm not a big one to like get out there and go, hey, like let, let me have a couple more takes at this, you know, like I I, I want to collaborate with them, but I also don't want to like I know how valuable time is. So that that I think that's the tricky essence is that balance of of time. You know, and and knowing sort of the, the freedom to play that you have on set, especially like on Star Trek. When I got on, I was like, 
okay, nobody knows who the hell you are, you know, underneath the makeup. And as soon as you get it on, you're like, uh, so am I an important character? Or, you know, you, you kind of blend in with all the background, especially like in the Klingon sets. And then, uh, you know, the importance of the, the voice and like adding to the character itself, it just seems so like masked, literally, you know, that uh, I found that to be really an interesting process. You know, you should, Damon, you should do like a, a seminar or some type of class because you, everything you just said is exactly how all actors should be. And, and it's shocking that some of them get this ego, especially when they're nobodies. I, I remember doing a short film a few years ago that I was a lead on and me and the other lead actor were talking to the director and we were doing like these different takes. And one of the takes that we did was a joke from the Star Wars universe Everyone used to say that George Lucas's version of directing was, that was great, but let's do the next one uh, faster and more intense. That, be that became like a thing. So on this little project we did, <laughs> me and the, and the other lead and the director, we would say, let's do it all the way you want, but could we please do one that's faster and more intense as a joke? Well, I'll never forget, we're sitting at the dining room table doing this scene and there's an actress there. She was, she's important to the show, but she wasn't a lead. And we did that take and then she literally dropped her line. We had to cut. And then she actually had the gall to turn to both of us and go, what are the you two doing? And we were like, what? what did you? So the director came on and it was a female director and she was like, excuse me, you just ruined our entire take. Who the fuck are you? And I shouldn't be swearing on, but it's to, to prove a point. She was so infuriated with this lady and she actually had the gall to tell us when I'm done today, and she only had to shoot for one day, thank God. She's like, I'm done and I'll have nothing to do with this film, not supporting it, because you guys are being so unprofessional. <laughs> and we're, we're all sitting there going, um, who's being unprofessional? Oh, it, it was, so well, I'm you, sure, you uh, spread the word. <laughs> Jennifer can probably add uh, way more insight in terms of, uh, as an editor and director, I just was working on Home Before Dark with this editor who is directing the show for the first time. And I was sort of, because he did the whole uh, first season and I was asking him like, how is it informing your direction? And uh, you know, you could tell that the day was like, the day can just get away from you if one actor is like, no, this scene's about me and I need, I, you, you know, I need another one, another one, another one. And, and like the editor is under, well, the director, who is an editor is under pressure from the producer to wrap it up and get on to the next scene and but he doesn't have the pieces that he wants and you know like i was asking him like how do you navigate that with with the actors so that the like do you have that um do you have that a dialogue or do you have like something that, that you you can um, resort to so that you can move efficiently for the pieces that you need because he was way more involved in in picking up things from the entire world as opposed to just like the two-hander that's happening at, at the moment, which I thought was really interesting. Lessons to be learned. So there you go. Let's move on to Jason. Jason, you, and if you guys haven't figured this out yet, I'm asking non-Star Trek questions so that our viewers can see the body of works that, that you guys have done aside from just Star Trek, but fans don't panic. We are getting back to Star Trek questions in a minute because that is our focus today. Jason, you, yeah. Uh, we're one of the stars of ESPN Playmakers. And I'd like to know, number one, it, it's a sports related uh, uh, project. Did you have any sports background because you played a linebacker in, in, in the project? Did you have any background in sports be, before you got the project or you know, in, in the past? And then whether you did or not, how much you know, practice or uh, research did you have to do on football playing and what a linebacker does to make your performance come to life. So speak to the, your, your experience on, on, on that. Sure. Um, well, I, uh, I played football in high school um, and I had always been involved in sports growing up. And I, I got recruited to play college ball and uh, I, I passed it up because uh, I had seen a lot of friends get their uh, bodies destroyed. Um, you know, knees, neck, shoulders, that kind of thing. And I, I figured it would be better to pretend uh, to get hurt or pretend to hurt others rather than actually get hurt myself. Um, 
And then, you know, I, I went full time into acting, went to school for a couple of years. Well, for eight years, I did uh, five years of uh, undergrad and three years of graduate school. And then, uh, you know, made my way out to LA. And oddly enough, there, you know, one of my big first big things was Playmakers. And uh, uh, I, I was at the time, I, I had just broken up with a girlfriend and had lost like uh, 40 or 50 pounds and uh, was really skinny. And uh, I was going to the gym like all the time, just doing, you know, cardio stuff. And then, uh, you know, I got this audition. They were like, well, Jason's really good for this, but he's just, he's not the right size. He's too skinny. And uh, my agent called me and he's like, hey, dude, look, I was able to talk to them uh, to see you again in 10 days. And you have to gain as much weight as you can in 10 days. So for 10 days, uh, I ate everything that I could find in the house. Uh, I, I went on weight gainer, which if anybody has eaten or drank weight gainer, it's the worst. It's like pancake batter. Uh, I was eating ice cream and, and in order to not have it just turned directly into fat, I was still working out like a madman, uh, but just switched to, to nothing but weights. And I was able to put on, I think about 12 pounds in 10 days, which is uh, insane. And then I had to wow. double up on sweatshirts and everything like that to make myself look even bigger when I went back in the room and uh, they didn't even recognize me. They were like, well, who are you? I was like, well, I was in here and they're like, you were skinny. Now you're like huge. I was like, well, you know, I do what it takes, what I have to. And I, I think that was the edge, you know, and actually landing that role. Oh, 12 pounds. I wish I could lose 12 pounds in a week. That would be. Oh, me too. <laughs> <laughs> well bravo man bravo so uh, i'm gonna ask some more star trek questions but before that let's do one of our fun little polls so guys who are watching and and my clients who are participating here everybody can participate we're gonna throw up a poll i'm gonna ask the question live everybody pick your question and then we will uh show the results after so where did you first see a star trek episode or movie was it on tv vhs DVD, Netflix, CBS All Access, or in a movie theater. So everybody out there, including our guests, please uh, do that. And I'm gonna ask the next question and then we'll do the results, okay? So this is going back to a question for all four of our guests today, and it's a Star Trek related one. I'd like to know from each of your experiences in the series or, or pro, you know, uh, project that you were in, Give us a, not an example, but give us a, a memory of a time that you were filming something very specific and you're on set and you're going, man, I don't know how this is going to turn out when I see the final, you know, version of this with the effects or whatever thrown into it. It's, it's going to suck. I can't believe it. And then when either the episode aired or, or in Jason's case, when the movie was out, you went to see it and you were like, holy mackerel, that is not what I was expecting that scene to be. And keep in mind, it doesn't have to be one of your own scenes. Maybe it was a scene you were watching them film while you were there, or that you, were, you had a very small part of. It doesn't have to be that you were the main part of that scene. Just something that while you were filming, you were like, oh my God, this is going to suck. And then when you saw it, you were blown away. Who would like to start that off? Put your, put your hand in the air. All right, Jennifer, go for it. Well, that's an easy question for me because I was flying the Enterprise, right? Um, and I was seated at the controls and I had, you know, all these stars around me, like everybody around me was a superstar. And I had just met Gene Roddenberry who welcomed me aboard. And I was literally sitting in here. And when you look up at the screen where all the planets are and all the universes that I'm taking the pilot into, it's just a, a blue screen or a green screen. I don't remember what color, but it's literally blank. So we're having to react to things that we're not even seeing. And when you're pressing these buttons, you're like, oh, this is kind of going to be dorky, kind of like what you were saying. And then when I saw it all put together, take, I got to take us into warp speed. It blew my mind. I was like, wow. So I'll never forget that. That was a pretty exciting moment. 
for me. Perfect answer. Thank you. Now the pressure is on to the gentleman. So gentlemen, who wants to go first with this question? They're all like, don't pick me, don't pick. Okay, Damon, go for it. Go for uh, it. Well, uh, it was one of these, uh, like, I can't remember the exact uh, aliens that we were meeting, but we were meeting like a, in a secret meeting to decide how the house of um, uh, Takuma would, no, it wasn't Takuma, what was it? Mokai, sorry. How the house of Mokai would move forward. And uh, so I, when I first read it, I thought we were going to be involved in this great battle. But sure enough, there's like, there's two sets going on. And this was like a much shorter scene than I actually. And uh, I have like these, uh, just these giant, they look like uh, bowling pins. And I'm like, okay, I don't see any other aliens. Um, are, are those guys the aliens? And they're like, yeah, yeah. Uh, that's who you're fighting. I'm like, okay. And so literally you could touch them and they fall over and they bounce around like bowling pins, right? Like, and you're like, okay, this does not look very good. <laughs> this is, I, I have no idea how they're gonna make this work, but sure enough on the day, it's like, they look like these amazing creatures. And you, like, I, I, of course you suspend uh, disbelief and uh, you go with it in the moment. But at the time, I'm like, I'm literally poking like this piece of plastic going like, I would kill you. And it's like, ding, 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 ding. Anyway, that's my Perfect, I love it. All right, Ronnie or Jason, who's gonna take it? Jason is, cause he laughed. Go for it, Jason. <laughs> oh, great, great. Now, um, I think the, the for me, um, I'm a red shirt. As uh, I don't know if any of you guys know there, but yes, the character of Cupcake is a red shirt. And uh, I have shot in all three of the the J.J. Abram movies a death scene, obviously, uh, because I'm a red shirt and they want to kill me. But every time that uh, that I, I went to the theater to go see, it was like deja vu, Groundhog's Day. Every time I went in, I, I know the scenes coming up that I'm about to get, you know, one of them, I got my head cut off. Uh, another one, I, I got the life drained out of me. Um, shot extensively these, these death scenes. And then the, the moment comes and it's just not there. And I'm like, holy, holy crap, I'm, I'm, I'm still alive, you know? I, maybe I'll get to do the next one. And then the next one comes and the same thing happened, you know, shot the death scene and go to the premiere and, and, and it's not there. And the third one, all my stuff and beyond got cut out 100%, like everything. And I was like, Oh my God, like I, I shot three months on this movie and every single piece of film that I did got shut out. So after, when I went to the premiere, uh, uh, at the party or whatever after I talked to JJ and, and the director at the time and I said, hey, well, what the hell? And they said, uh, oh, don't worry about it. You know, it's, you're still alive. So if we ever do another one, we'll bring you back again. <laughs> so was, that's kind of been the shocker for me. It's, it's every actor's dream to be on Star Trek, but then it would be every other dream of that to survive if you're a red shirt. So Jason, you've done it all. Which is great. I'm I'm the glitch in the matrix. That's that's what uh, JJ every time he refers to me is like. Didn't we kill you yet? I was like, no, not yet. You can't kill me. There you go. You see, cupcakes survives and thrives. I love it. All right, Ronnie, the pressure is on. Um, you know what? I'm I'm gonna cop out and uh, kind of agree with Jennifer, and it's um, playing with the green screen. You know what I mean? Like a lot of times we're, we're getting like shot at and, and the ship's vibrating. So you have to throw yourself all over the place. And I, I feel like a complete fool, but then I see it on camera. And I'm like, oh, okay, all right, yeah, yeah, I believe it. I believe it. So I think, I think that's the, the, the toughest part, but yeah. Okay. Well, can I add it, one thing to that? Of course. Um, and now back to me being an editor. Now I'm actually in the editing room on some films and the film I'm working on right now is called Empire Queen and it's a medieval fantasy with a lot of magic. So I'm actually removing the green screens, working with the special effects artists now and seeing it all come to life. 
And you'd be amazed at how many people there are that do each little job to make this all come to life for us. So let I throw that in. No, no, thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. And, and Ronnie, I guess you never have to worry because when we watch Star Trek Discovery or any of the Star Trek projects, none of you look like fools. So you're, you're doing your job and it works. All right, so let's take, uh, let's get the results to our poll and then we're gonna jump to some fan questions. So the winner is TV. So the majority of people uh, first saw a Star Trek episode or movie on television. Excellent, all right, thanks for playing along guys. So here we go, we are going to take some fan questions now. These are in no particular order. And um, you know, I am going to admit, this is the first time I've ever admitted this on screen, but I had some fans get mad at me a few weeks ago. They said, are you cherry picking questions? Guys, it's not that I'm cherry picking questions, but I am screening questions because there are certain questions, especially Ronnie and Damon are not allowed to answer because of a CBS <laughs> gag order. Um, so you guys have to bear with me. We're and I'm also trying to pick questions that try to fill out our show and make things interesting for you all, okay? So I'm not, I don't hate anybody. I love every single one of you, um, but, but don't hate me because I'm, I'm picking certain questions. Plus you have to remember, we may not have time to get to everybody's questions as well. The idea is we're having fun. So let's kick things off with a question from John. John is directing this question to Ronnie. Ronnie, he wants to know who is the biggest prankster on set? <laughs> Um, I would I would have to say Mary Wiseman. Mary, Mary, <laughs> Mary Wiseman is uh, she's a, a big joker. She's a lot of fun. Um, always always so upbeat. But I, I think everybody kind of has a, a little practical joker in them on the on the cast anyway. So but but if I had to pick one person in particular, it's definitely Mary. Okay. Definitely Mary. Thank you so much. All right, our next question is from a Jason Yu. And I, I love this question, Jason, thank you. And it is directed to all of our guests. So whoever wants to answer first, please put your hand up, okay? In your opinion, what would you say is one of the best life lessons that Star Trek can teach us to help us get through difficult circumstances that we are currently in? Excellent question. So think about it. Let me ask the question again. In your opinion, to all of our guests, what would you say is one of the best life lessons that Star Trek can teach us to help us get through some of the difficult circumstances that we are currently in today? Star Trek is the future. So, oh, we've stumped our panel almost. Jennifer, go for it. Okay, this isn't very huge and profound, but it's something that helped me personally. And I, I know it's silly, but I, I have been in positions where I've had to have a lot of confrontation either as a producer or some of the other side jobs I've taken. And I used to kind of like really almost panic because my emotions were in everything. A lot of artists were very emotional. And so by I, one of my favorite characters, Leonard Nimoy, I, I know I'm old school, but Spock, you know, he, he was able to put his emotions in check. And I, I actually had to use that a couple of times when somebody, I was in a confrontation and I, I will think just be Spock. <laughs> and I will literally just kind of think logically, okay, they're angry, but I didn't necessarily, and I put, I've used the whole Spock mentality to kind of sometimes get through an intense situation. A, a little bit fun Star Trek. That is, that is the perfect answer. And I can tell you, most of my family and friends would probably wish that I did that because I have a very <laughs> short fuse. So I'm going to remember that answer, Jennifer. Perfect. Think Spock. <laughs> think Spock. Think Spock. We'll, Tyler, let's, let's make t-shirts for Vegas that say Think Spock and it'll be our own little inside gag. Okay. All um, right. Damon, you're shaking your head. I think you want to answer. Sure. Um, I thought Ronnie was up first, but uh, no, no, no. It's all you. <laughs> okay. Uh, well, it's yeah. No, no I'm drawing a blank. Um, no, I would say that it's uh, about accepting that uh, things can change and that life uh, has all these uh, crazy forms that uh, we may think uh, uh, one person or being is in such a way and and, and demonize them as opposed to, um, you know, understanding it and accepting it, or at least inquiring to like, to see the other side of the story. And for me, I think that's uh, one of the life lessons that 
I've learned from the show is that, you know, you have these um, perceptions of other species or aliens or even characters that are, are, are um, they're not true. They're, they're these uh, precon preconceived ideas that uh, we, we make up. And uh, especially when you look at like Black Lives Matter right now, like I think a lot of people um, need to see, well, I mean, that's one thing that I'm coming to see more and more is that my own sort of um, uh, ingrained belief about the way that I thought, especially living in Canada, how like we think that we're so accepting and uh, we don't we don't see like the hidden racism that's out there. And, and I think that, uh, you know, Star Trek allows you to sort of witness other cultures and uh, alien forms and, and discover Oh, we, we lost him partly on an I still there answer. No, we lost you at right at the end of your answer. Do it. Say the end again. Oh, um, just that. What was I saying? Uh, that you know that acceptance of other forms or, or skin colors or whatever it is. Ha everyone has a story that um, we have to investigate and explore and and try to understand. And you know, sometimes we go to war for. The things that we believe to be right. Perfect answer. Thank you so much, Damon. Okay, Ronnie, the pressure's on. No, actually, I, I think my answer piggybacks that. It, and um, I think what Star Trek does for me is it um, it promotes inclusivity. Like, like it, it, it's it, it represents. It shows representation of everybody and everything. You know, and um, it, it's one thing I really noticed at the convention in Las Vegas is I saw, I saw people of every shade, shape, <laughs> you know, like it's a great representation of everybody. And I think it allowed it to be this big mixing pot of love and appreciation. And I think that's what we need more of right now is um, one empathy, but also just love and appreciation and i i think if we we can extend that to our our neighbor regardless of how they look or 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 what they may be going through um we may not be in the situations that we currently are perfect answer my goodness jason you you have a lot of uh, pressure now <laughs> but i'm gonna, i'm going to piggyback on on you know everybody's answer here right here it's uh for me you know, the, the greatest lessons about Star Trek is uh, unity, obviously, uh, diversity, but, you know, the, the, the common, um, how do I say it, the common sort of bond that, it, that keeps all of humanity together is uh, discovery and exploration. And uh, I think that's what Star Trek does so well. Um, it, it's always been, uh, you know, maybe not the J.J. Abrams blow them up kind of ones, but they, they still had good stories. But the original tracks and some of the, you know, TV series that are out now, it's they really do a, a very good job at uh, exploring the human condition. And it's it's that, that diversity and unity, um, finding the common ground that unites everybody and... Uh, you know, bringing us all together. I, I hope that we, you know, can live in a world like that where, you know, our differences are celebrated and and not seen as our, our weaknesses or or something to be disdained. That's, that's pretty much it for me. That is the perfect wrap up to that question, Jason. Thank you. And thank you for the fan that sent it in. That's very profound. Um, all except for the Klingons, because they suck. No offense, Dave. <laughs> well, you, you got to have a common enemy, you know. So be it the Borg or the Klingons or, you know, whatever. You got to have somebody that we all fight against, right? Exactly. Right. Yeah, but even inside a Klingon's heart, they don't feel that they're bad people. So they, they should have a voice as well, right? Perfect, there you go. perfect rebuttal. Perfect rebuttal. Thank you. <laughs> perfect. All right. I am going to actually ask my tech guy, Tyler, to activate his camera and join us for a moment. So Tyler, you're gonna be a superstar. Here's your five minutes of fame. 
Thank you, Tyler, for joining us. Everybody, Tyler, Tyler, the world. Okay, Tyler actually did a fact check for Jennifer's question regarding the uh, piloting of the enterprise. So, uh, Tyler, what did you discover? No, Jennifer is 100% correct. Um, she, she, she knows what she's talking about. She knows. Um, she, we can, you know, fans will kind of nitpick this because you have helm and navigation and all that stuff, depending on the ship you're talking about. But with the exceptions, you know, of like Ilea and Savic at navigation and con, like Jennifer, she, she drove the D, man. She drove the Enterprise D, and that's freaking awesome. So she's got a very special place here. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Tyler. Appreciate you hanging out in the background every day. Love you. There you go, Jennifer. All right, we're going to go to our next fan question. Let me pop back on my glasses, gang. Uh, this is from Lisa Herrera, and this is directed to, again, all of our guests. Any cool or funny behind-the-scenes stories from your time on a Star Trek set? So that's a thinking question, unless something pops out right at you. Who's got it? Ronnie's smiling big time, so you've got something. Uh, honestly, every, every day on set is uh, a cool or <laughs> hilarious experience. Um, everybody there is like, we're, we're very, very tightly knit. So um, we're always having fun. Sometimes we get in a little bit of trouble because we're having too much fun. But honestly, we're just always joking around and playing. And I think it actually plays on screen a lot because of it. So every day, every day on set. Right, every day. So b work is not boring for Ronnie. Jennifer, how about you? <laughs> oh, well, I'm a little bit out of my league because a lot of you have been on several episodes and I was just on one really. Although I did get people recognizing me from for about a year after one episode, just to show you the exposure. But I was on a really great episode, which had to do with shape shifting. It was called the dolphin. But um, I just, I guess my experience I already mentioned meeting Gene Roddenberry. I couldn't believe that he happened to be there. Um, Jonathan Frakes was the um, was really giving. He was the prankster. I oh, yeah. <laughs> went over to craft services, like in between when we're not um, rehearsing or shooting. There's a table with all these goodies and food, and Jonathan, for some reason, really wanted to welcome me aboard. And he was just him and the director was Rob Bowman. They came up surrounded me and started saying, so what's your first name? And asking me about my character and to see if I had done enough background research because as actors, we're supposed to kind of figure out who our characters are and they go, you know, what's her strength? Where was she from? Are her parents alive? How did she learn to pilot? And they just started throwing all these questions at me and I was a little intimidated, but I played along. And Jonathan gave me the first name of Anthena. He said, well, you have to have a name that way you'll be a more member. So my name was Anthea Gibson and I got a playing card. I have a doll in my image and I was blown away that that could all happen from, from that one really, really cool experience that I'll never forget. All right, great. <laughs> Who wants to go next? Oh gosh. Uh... I, I don't know. I, my, my story is more about wardrobe, actually. Like uh, when I first, uh, like the first day I was going to wardrobe, I, you know, I live relatively close to the set too and, or the studio. And so I told my wife, yeah, I'll be back in an hour. And like most wardrobe fittings are, you go in, they, they tuck it up and it's fine. And I get there and they put on this, like, it was essentially like, I don't know, layers and layers of like the, this fur. And then they're like, yeah, I don't know. And then they just start like manipulating it on the day. And so I was there for about seven, eight hours where they took this original concept of the costume and uh, created this whole different thing on the spot. And like they, you know, they have like seamstress and like everyone's in there hands on and you're getting sewn and stitched. And I'm just going like, I, I have no idea like what I even look like. And uh, the thing that just blew me away was like the attention to detail and, and Gersha is, I mean, she's a genius and she's been, I mean, as you've seen on the show, she's just created like these costumes that are so mind blowing. But yeah, for me, I was just, I was blown away by, I, I just assumed it was one thing and you get there and you're like, it's a whole other world and you better up your knowledge, you know. Thank you, Damon. All right, Jason. Yeah, I guess. 
Oops. Oh, we can't hear you. Hang on. There you go. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, sir. Can you hear me now? Okay. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, there's a ton of them, obviously. Uh, but uh, one that kind of sticks out to me is is something that happened quite common when we were shooting all all three of them. Uh, is JJ? Um, he has, you know, I don't I don't know if he does this on all of his films, but uh, he always uh, had a microphone uh, nearby, and you know, on days when we'd have lots of people, sometimes there's you know two three hundred people. It's hot. Is there's lots of you know costumes and people were working you know long long hours they're 14 to 16 hour days sometimes longer um, he was always keeping things um, light and fun and would uh, just to lighten the load uh, in the middle of you know this chaos he would start beatboxing and he's a really <laughs> dope beatboxer so uh, I don't know if, if you ever get the opportunity or pleasure that dude can, you know, he, he belongs in like, you know, the Beastie Boys. He's the, he's the, the missing Beastie Boy right there. But that was, all, that was always fun, just him telling jokes, telling stories, you know, singling out people in the background that, uh, you know, were sweating their asses off in these costumes and stuff. It was, it, he always kept the, the set light. Sounds that sounds very much like uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Friggs. He, he's he's very much like that, and like always singing. And so yeah. if I, if I could add to that, Jonathan is man. That guy's a light. He's he's amazing. Yeah, he's also just really. He went out of his way to make everybody feel comfortable. Yeah, uh, seems like he has a lot of empathy. You know. Yeah, he's lovely. <laughs> he's great. Sounds like you guys work for some amazing people, which is really wonderful because, you know, going to work for someone that you didn't like would suck. So that's good. Our next comment and question is from Chris Gallagher. Chris, is, I mean, uh, Jason, this is directed towards you. First of all, Chris would like you to know that he's very glad that Cupcake is still alive and on the <laughs> Enterprise. And he, would like, <laughs> and he would like to know if Cupcake was to die on screen, how would you have it be? Ah, that's a good question. Um, well, I can start that off by saying uh, how I, I have died. One was uh, a Klingon cut my head off, um, which with a, I think it's called a katana. I don't know, somebody, somebody probably knows the answer to that. Uh, it looks like this very wicked looking sword um carl uh urban when uh, one of the one of the time had suggested that i should be um in exploded where my my blood and guts would go all over the walls he's a he's a bit sick and he laughed very hard at that one um i i don't i don't i'd like to die an old old man you know old man on the enterprise where you know that that's the safest easiest way you know for a red shirt to die probably but it, you know most likely it's going to be something very violent in reality because that's what red shirts do they i'm die. seeing the whole uh, movie here called death of a red shirt <laughs> jennifer i think you should keep that in mind i'm sure jason would be in it for you wink wink well, well, hey, if, oh yeah i hope i can call your people if Tarantino gets to make it, I'm sure you'll have a pretty gruesome death. <laughs> oh, uh, you know it. He's, it. he's like the, the, you know, does the grand finale of, of Blood and Guts at the end of every movie. Yeah, so. It's fitting. I wonder what it would do with phasers. <laughs> <laughs> All right, guys, for fun, let's do another poll. Tyler, throw up another poll for us. Again, this is for everyone watching to join and participate and our guests, and it's all for fun. Which Star Trek alien species would you rather be? A Klingon, a Vulcan, a Romulan, a Ferengi, or a Borg? So we will let everyone chime into that while we ask our next question. Speaking of species, this, this question is actually for Damon. Damon, this is from me. Can you share with us a little bit about what it was like to be on Klingon school? How hard was it for you to learn the Klingon language for your role? 
Uh, well, it was hands-on in the sense that um, I'm drawing a blank on her name now, the dialect coach. Uh, it's been a while. Um, it, we, we would have these like private sessions and then uh, prior to going, that, that was, I think, part of the panic attack that I had that day when I, my first day when I was doing the off-camera stuff was I wasn't really that comfortable with the language. And uh, I, I keep having these recurring dreams where like um, I'm on some big movie and some like I'm having a scene with someone like the last one I had was Jim Carrey. And I'm just like, I have no idea what my lines are. And I'm like, can I get a script? And like, yeah, we don't have sides on set. And uh, so that like I have this recurring dream, but it kind of like came to a, a fold with that, that first day on Star Trek when, when I got there and nobody knew who I was. And I didn't really have like full grasp of the language and uh they're like okay and action and i had the first line and it sure enough I was... no pressure like uh okay but yeah uh but it did i mean the beauty of that was that i got to like spend two days doing off-camera lines and getting getting the accent down and then seeing takuma what was that actor's name now i'm drawing a blank on his name but takuma the whole like pilot episode is around him so he's got you know the weight of his shoulders and uh he's a british actor i gotta look it up or the t uh, anyway um but he was having trouble you know and he was like yeah they keep they actually they changed he has this mass this monologue that uh, he is basically d directing all of the uh, klingons to come with him and fight and it's, you know, it's a good like, like two, three page thing. And they rewrote it like the night up, you know, and he's walking around going, I've done Shakespeare. Like, this is how, like, I'm trying to get my, my tongue around this. And uh, I mean, I, I, yeah, my, my scenes were few and far between, but uh, they, they definitely, they school you well. And, and being on set, it's like they're on top of it nonstop. All right. Very cool. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the answer. Chris Tyler, Obi. let's, what? Uh, what? Chris Obi. Chris Obi. Okay. Let it, uh, Tyler, let's look at our results to our poll. Okay, so it looks like Vulcan is the winner. Everyone wants to be a Vulcan. I think, like I said earlier, I, I know my family would like me to be. So, all right, our next question is from William Conlin, and it is directed to all of our guests. He wants to know if you could be in any episode of Star Trek, which episode would it be? And I'm going to expand on his question and say, guys, it can be in any film the originals, the newer ones, doesn't matter, or any of any of the TV series, what would you want to be on? Hmm. Ooh, see that? They're all like, what do I say without getting in trouble with CBS? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I can't remember the name of the episode, but it was in the uh, original Star Trek when they actually went to like modern time. Um, yeah, where, 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 um, Shatner and, and he fell in love with, um, I can't remember the episode. Uh, give me a second. Um, no, but I mean, all the Star Trek fans will know exactly what you're talking about. I, 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 we're on the edge of forever, Ronnie. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. It, 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 there it is. <laughs> Perfect. Who else? Jason, Damon. For me, it, it would be on Black Mirror, to be perfectly honest, with, with, that, um, with that episode, or it was a double episode, I think they did? Yeah. Yeah, that, uh, that just blew my mind, the whole world within a world, and anyway. Okay, perfect answer. Going Black Mirror. <laughs> I like it, I like it. No pressure, guys, but I, Jennifer and Jason. Okay, I would say that, I, I'm, again, I'm, I, I keep going way back, but the original pilot, because that's where the birth of this whole universe came. And it's so nice to get in on the ground floor. So it was a, it was a really neat episode. But I also like the movie that Jonathan Franks directed. I forget what it's called. I think it was First Contact. Um, there was, it was one of the movies where they also, yeah. yeah, is that what's called? That was really good too. Excellent. Jason, the pressure is I, on. I think for me, hands down, without a doubt, would be the Wrath of Khan. Um, just because uh, I freaking love Ricardo Montalban in that and just how over the top everything is in that and, you know, the, the costumes, the, the, the language, the, all the Shakespearean stuff, uh, 
and, and Genesis, you know, the, the forming of a new planet, and, you know, life and sight that, that you could just explode a bomb and like there's suddenly this, you know, life everywhere. I thought that was pretty, pretty rad. That's, a, that's definitely my, my favorite movie of all time in the Star Trek universe too. Well, I concur with you. Wow. Excellent. These are excellent answers, guys. And I'm hoping that the fans are loving every minute of this because I am. We're almost to the end of our show today, guys. But um, if everyone's willing, we can ask just a couple more questions here. So let's see. I, 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 what, who do we pick? What do we pick? Uh, Admiral Cupcake. Hey, Chris is throwing that at you, uh, Jason, for the future. Maybe he'll be an admiral. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here's a good I'll one. I'll take it. I'll take it. Okay. So this is from Homer. This is a good question. And again, this is directed to all of you. And this, is, this will attain, ascertain to your, your acting, acting ability and preparation. Did, did all of you create backstories for your car Star Trek characters? And if you did, is it possible to share them with, with us, the viewers, without spoiling anything up and coming? So what'd you do to basically to prepare for your role, specifically in your role for the Star Trek universe? Did you make something up in your mind about the character, their background, their family, their heritage? Maybe, you know, I mean, Cupcake's a bully. Was he bullied when he was little? Uh, you know, Damon, you're a Klingon. Are you a, are, was your Klingon a nice person for real or a nice creature for real? Or was he just a complete ass? So on. Well, and so I'll, I'll be perfectly honest. I, I didn't really know. Uh, I wasn't that well informed with the Klingon world. So I started doing my own research, uh, watching, uh, you know, whatever episodes that they were involved in. But even like when I got the job, I had no idea like what direction they were going with the characters or who was important versus, you know, like the first, uh, the pilot episode, it seems like, okay, we're going with this guy to Kuvma, right? So are we, uh, are we following him or what? Like, it was sort of like, a lot of it was on the fly. And then in the moment, you're like, wait a sec, I gotta stand up for myself in this moment. But, you know, you're, you're, you're being informed uh, script to script sort of you, of your relevance in terms of the Klingon world, which I thought was, for me, I was like, I, I can create a backstory, but it's it's not going to serve the story if they just change it uh, because of their their vision is so completely different. I think uh, because they're so um, animalistic, and uh, I thought for me it was important to like to, to feel that just that primal sense of, of the world and that uh, you know heightening any type of irritation or anger or smells or it was, it was more getting into the, uh, an animal based sort of uh, uh, ideology as opposed to like, and, and then as you go through and you learn that you are, you know, a leader of uh, the House of Mokai, then you start informing yourself based off of that. But yeah, for me, I was kind of like thrown in, in the waters, like tr trying to grasp at anything. All right. Thank you, Damon. Great. Who's next? Who wants to go? Uh, I'll go. I um, like this sort of ties into the earlier question um, with where Jonathan and um, and Rob came up to me and started grilling me on my backstory. And I guess I had been a bit of a lazy actress because I had just kind of tried to get, be very serious and smart and all those things. And but after they asked me all these questions, I did kind of come up with a backstory. And I decided that um, I was an only child, but my father had wanted a boy. And so therefore I was always a tomboy, tomboy, tomboy. But then my mother was like, you're not being ladylike. And so I had, based on them kind of pumping me for this information, I created this little backstory for Ensign Gibson. Oh, very cool. That's great. Thank you, Jennifer. Jason or Ronnie? Um, I, I definitely created a backstory. I can't share too much of it, but I know that with each one of my crew members, I have like a, a relationship that I have with each one of them or one that I aspire to have. Um, I'll share one though, one with uh, Ensign Tilly is that we don't like each other. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So we're always throwing shade uh, anytime we can, which is, which is so much fun. <laughs> so in between scenes and stuff like that, we're, we're, we're always kind of just poking fun at each other, but I love Mary so much. She's great. 
I love that. I'm going to pay attention in season three to that. All right, Jason, you're next. Um, I, you know, with, with mine, um, it was pretty typical Midwest guy, kind of pretty much based on myself, um, with the exception in the, in the first one, um, I didn't realize this until I actually got there on set that, uh, uh Ahura and, and I, um, kind of bonded together, became kind of best friends in the academy. So, um, we've kind of remained close, even though she's gone up into the, you know, command and stuff like that. But a lot of our, my character story revolves around her and, and, and her story. Um, I actually saw they had done, somebody had done a comic book and uh, my character was actually in it, which was insane. Um, but it had a lot um, to do with, uh, you know, I, I liked seeing how other people picture the backstory. And I was like this, you know, mama's boy who was like writing home to his parents on everyday life of what happens in the enterprise, <laughs> which, you know, I guess I, I am a bit of that as well, you know, uh, kind of, a, you know, a down to earth person. So that's kind of what the character was based on. I love this insight. Oh, this Thank you. I'm sure the fans are enjoying it. All right, we're going to make this our last question before we do our sign-offs. This is from John uh, Hancock. John would like to know, have any of you had any strange or weird fan encounters? And that could either be on the street, maybe at a convention, maybe you've got a stalker online. And I think I'll add to it because I had a question like this, similar to this. I'll add, have any of you, what's the weirdest Trek question you've ever been asked? Um, and if it was on the show today, please let me know because that'll make me feel fantastic. That's a joke. You can say it. I don't care. Okay. Who wants to go first? Who's got a moment? They're thinking, they're thinking. I, I, go, go Ronnie. I don't know if it, it, it's really strange or weird, but, um, it's happened a few times at the gym where I'll be working out and, and like, like somebody will be randomly like just staring at me and I'll be like, and they're like, I know you. And I'm like, I, I, I don't know, maybe. And then they're like, do you act? I'm like, yeah. And then I always get the question, well, what do you act? And I'm like, I'm not going to do that. I'm like, what do you watch? And then they're like, uh, Star Trek. I'm like, that's it. And, and <laughs> yeah. So it, it's usually, but I, I've gotten it at the gym a whole lot of times in California and Toronto. Perfect answer. Thank you so much, Ronnie. All right, Jennifer, Jason, or Damon? I, I just get like weird people contacting me. Like every once in a while, I, I always forget to check like the direct messaging. Then you're like, oh, you have like a bunch of requests. And then it, it's like, it's so often like, uh, you know, I don't open them, but they're like crazy, like nude photos. And uh, every once in a while you're like, like what's going on here? <laughs> and then of course they get insulted if you don't respond so then you get like this massive backlash of like or i, I think the funniest request is like give me your address because i i, I want to send you something you're like why would i just like some person off social media just but it, it, like you can tell the tone is they're insulted that you're not responding and it just gets like the the vitriol just builds up and and then i discovered you can block that so yeah life got better or you just don't even do that stuff. <laughs> Got gotcha. you. Perfect answer. Perfect answer. All right, Jennifer or Jason. I've, um, I've actually hadn't had an. I haven't had any weird fans from Star Trek, but I've had lots of other characters. But I don't think I'll go into that exactly. But I will say that my Star Trek fans have just been the coolest people. I've had such good luck. I haven't had anything negative at all. Um, lots of people just, you know, wanting picture, wanting autograph, and um, it's all been very positive, knock on wood, so far. So, I've been lucky. We'll keep the trend going. All right, Jason, how about you? Uh, I'm not sure about uh, weird uh, questions. You know, I get, I get a lot of what uh, Ronnie uh, had said, like, you know, people like, I know you from somewhere. I've seen you. And, you know, it's like, okay, cool. And, uh, but that, that's very flattering. It's a, it's, it's an awesome part of, uh, 
of the job. Um, everyone, once they find out that I've done a Star Trek, always wants to know if I've met the holy, you know, trinity of, you know, Kirk or Spock or, or, uh, uh, or who would be the, the, you know, Picard or, or something like this, you know, uh, if I've actually met those actors or, you know, talk to them and uh, you know my answer is the cl out of all of them the closest that I came to an actual conversation was with uh, Leonard Nimoy I went into the uh, to the trailer the makeup trailer and I was gonna tell him what a big fan I was but the dude was fast asleep so <laughs> you know I'm not gonna make him for that so I was just like ah oh, cool I got to see Spock and, and that was it all right, perfect. All right, perfect. Hey guys, this was great. Thank you so much. Uh, before we do all of our sign-offs, I have to remind Jason and Ronnie, when we're done at the show today, don't log off of this session because we have a video chat to do with you guys. Damon and Jennifer, when we, once we sign off, you guys are able to, to actually leave, okay? So we have come to the end of our show, guys. I know there were questions we didn't get to. I appreciate everyone uh, timing in. And I do appreciate everyone who, who tuned in today. I give this speech every week and this week is no different. Cool Waters Productions is a small family run business. It's, it's me and my family. We've been in business for 25 years, but we're not a multi-million dollar studio out here in Hollywood. And you by tuning in today, buying an autograph, buying a virtual ticket, have supported small business in America. And small business in America is the backbone of America. And I greatly appreciate in these hard times that all of you have supported us. I thank every fan out there, so thank you. I also thank all of my cast for joining me today and remind everybody that right now, my tech guy Tyler is going to put up a link in the chat room. We are going to leave the ability to purchase autographs from any of our guests today online until Monday morning. So if you didn't purchase an autograph yet, you have the ability to do so today. Uh, the guys will personalize it if you want, you, and, and that's no extra charge if you want your name on it. Don't forget Christmas is coming. Maybe you give it to a fan, a, a family, you know, fan who's a Star Trek fan for Christmas. You never know. With all that being said, I have to do our final shout outs again to the people that helped support us today. Trek Movie, Trek Central, Pop Culture Hero Coalition, Trek Geeks, NerdReport.com, Jay Stuby, and the Omega Particle Podcast. Appreciate all of those groups for tuning in. I mean, uh, helping to spread the word. My tech guy, Tyler, my webmaster, Sarah, thank you so much. I appreciate it. So without further ado, I'm going to ask our guests to sign off with their thanks. And let's start with ladies first. Jennifer, your goodbyes, please. Thank you so much. It was great being on the show. Thank you again, Derek, for, for letting me be part of this. And let me give a shout out to my movie that's coming out soon, uh, Empire Queen. So keep your eyes out for it. Empire Queen. We will Empire look out Queen for our Jennifer. Yeah. Thanks. Medieval fantasy with lots of magic. Awesome. All right. Thanks, Jennifer. Take care. All right, Damon, your goodbyes, please. All right. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, Derek, and uh, good hanging out with y'all. And uh, watch Home Before Dark on Apple TV. Absolutely, Damon. Thank you so much. Take care and stay safe. All right, Jason, your goodbyes. Remember, when your camera disappears, don't log off, okay? Uh, thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, Derek, for having me here and uh, live long and prosper. I can do that thing with my hand. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Jason. We'll see you in a few minutes. All right, Ronnie, you have the floor, sir. Uh, Derek, thank you again for having me. And uh, thank you, everyone, for that tuned in. I appreciate you guys. You guys are always so loving. And uh, um, I just appreciate you so much. And uh, tune in to the new season. I think you guys will enjoy it. Season three. We can't wait to see you, Ronnie. Okay, don't log off. We'll see you in a few minutes. Thanks so much, man. So guys, that's the end of our show. We hope that you will join us next week for our Peanuts reunion. And here's a little uh, tidbit for those of you who don't know. Next week is going to be the first time ever in in-house con history that the signings that we do for all of you, the viewers, are actually going to be shown live at the end of next week's episode. So if you wanna see the five Peanuts voice actors actually sign your autograph to you right there live on the spot, buy your tickets to that now and it's going to happen. I appreciate everyone out there. Stay safe and healthy. And hey, this isn't a movie theater. Our credits are only 36 seconds long. So please watch.
We'll see you next week. Take care now. Bye-bye.